I say good morning. Alright. Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome all the virtual people and or the visitors, the um, online people, and everybody in attendance today. Um, if you want to donate to the church, the tithes and offerings, there's plates on the side of the stage and in the vestibule in the back. Um, the uh, um, if you wanna, if you're a visitor and you want to become a member of the church, you can rip out the thing in the bulletin and you can put it in the offering plates um, at the beginning end of the service. Um, um, the announcements. After following this service, there will be a chicken pastry lunch. Plates are $10 each. It's support the youth to go to church camp this summer. Um, there's also going to be a pie and cake auction following that. Um, for March 24th, next week, um, it's going to be a Palm Sunday um, and family's luncheon after service. There will also be a baptism that service um, for Luke, Evan, Eric, and Greg. Um, the, the um, we're looking for um, nursery nursery volunteers for the month of March, for March 17th, 24th, and 31st. Um, there's also a women's ministry roundtable meeting on March 18th at 10:30. Um, the the also there's a men's Bible study um, on every Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, or 7 o'clock. And then there's a sign-up sheet for the Easter Sunday um, who's going to be attending there and who can cook food for the Easter Sunday meal on that side. And let us prepare our hearts to the worship to God.
This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step up with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Bow your heads. Dear Lord, we come before you today thanking you for your endless love and mercy. As we gather here, we ask that your presence is with us and fill our hearts with grace. We pray for the ones on our prayer list and all of those who need you, that you give them courage and strength. Be with us as we continue to worship. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand with us for a song of praise. Firm foundation.
Today's New Testament reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And it reads, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join us for the song of worship.
the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Thank you. Today's Old Testament reading will come from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place where which I carried you into exile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Can all the children come to the front for the children's message? Hey, how are you guys doing? Have you guys had a good weekend so far? Can you guys tell us your names? So who do you guys go to when you need help? Your mom and dad? Who do you ask for help, Luke? You all know? Who do you ask for help, Ella? You don't know? Y'all don't ask anybody for help. You do? Who do you ask for help? Your teacher. That's a good answer. So we ask people for help when we need help on our homework, when we've lost a toy, or when we can't reach something on a high shelf. Our teachers and parents and our friends are great ways to get help. We can always count on the people in our life to support and guide us. But at the end of the day, God is our backbone, and he will never fail us. So we have those people in our life to help us and guide us, but we can always count on Jesus and God too, can't we? With those big problems. Will you guys please pray with us? Dear Lord, thank you for giving us each of these children and for allowing us to spend this time together. Please continue to guide us throughout this life. Amen. Okay, you guys can go to Kingdom Kids with us.
Good morning. It is a good morning for two reasons. Number one, nobody better not pinch me. (laughs) Number two, it's pretty, ain't it? All right, before I get straight into the message today, I wanted to um, share with you the quote that served as my inspiration. Um, It was said by one of my favorite intellectuals who ever lived, a man who certainly needs no introduction, Professor Albert Einstein. He once said, try not to become a man of success rather to become a man of value. Well, Einstein died in 1955, so this had to have been said sometime before then, but it offers timeless wisdom. This quote still resonates with us today, still resonates with me, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that, unfortunately, we live in a world that would have us believe that We have to be successful in order to be valuable. But our perception of success is so greatly distorted by the things that the world places value on. Money. Money is a big one. There's a lot of people in the world who base all of their decisions around money. What they're going to do for a living, right down to even who they're going to marry. Mansions luxury cars, designer clothes, collector shoes. When we see somebody with all of these possessions, we automatically start to think they must be doing life right. They've got it all. And don't take my word for it. Just look at the way our society puts these successful people on a pedestal. The Elon Musk, the Warren Buffetts, the Bill Gates of the world. <clears throat> Those who are less fortunate, people without homes or jobs or clothes to look presentable, our society views as lesser human beings. But today I want to challenge you, and this is a challenge. It's always a challenge to try to change the way you think about something. I want to challenge you to observe a different perspective. Has anybody ever told you how much money it takes to buy a ticket into heaven? Some televangelist may have told you that. (laughs) When Jesus was suffering on the cross and at his right hand was a thief who was also sentenced to die, and the thief said to Jesus, remember me. Did Jesus ask him how big his house was? How good his grades were? How much he donated to charity? Or how many church services he'd attended throughout his life? Did he ask how many home runs he'd hit or goals he'd scored? Did he ask how many friends he had or degrees he was able to obtain? Did he ask what his salary was? Jesus didn't ask him any questions at all. He stated simply, I say to you today, today you will be with me in paradise. So clearly there's a major difference between the way the world views success and the way God views success. A lowly thief who had been shunned by society, a society that refused to give him a chance at redemption, a man who was not at all successful by the world's standards. And yet, despite all of this, he earned the greatest gift of all, eternity in God's presence. Why did Jesus dine with prostitutes and tax collectors, and sinners from all walks of life. He called on Peter. Peter had a temper. Thomas was a doubter. Moses had a stutter. Paul was a murderer. Abraham was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him. Because he understood that there's nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven. All the things we chase after, the things that we dream for, 
They'll be gone in a hundred years' time. Our lives are a very small strand on the long line of eternity, but 20 minutes on the timeline of history. Our bodies will fade away. So will our money and our shoes and our clothes and everything else. So I hope this message can be sort of a reset for you. Maybe you've been stressing too much lately about obtaining some kind of possession. And I hope that you'll be reminded today that as followers of Christ, we are assured that we've already been given the ultimate gift. We have all that matters. <clears throat> Once you come to the realization that the creator of the cosmos desires to have a relationship with you, that he sacrificed his only son on a cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins and spend eternity in heaven, then everything else seems secondary. You'll stop being jealous of people who make more money or have nicer things. You'll stop being greedy and constantly trying to get ahead of the next guy. And Perhaps most importantly, you'll stop being insecure because you'll know that there's absolutely nothing this world can give you that you've not already been given. That's an inner peace that can't be translated to words. Amen? One of the greatest lessons that we can learn as Christians is that we cannot serve two glories. What exactly do I mean by that? We cannot say that we are followers of God and at the same time say that we love the things of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. That's all we really need to hear, but I haven't heard any stomachs growl, so <laughs> keep going. Have you ever done something that you weren't very proud of? I have. I think we all have. Usually when we do something that we're not proud of, it's a result of us going against our morals and our belief system. In pursuit of the world, a lot of people will sacrifice anything and everything for money, fame, fun, pleasure. I mean, you name it, the world can give it to you. The pursuit of success is corrupting when done for personal gain. That's why it's essential that we understand how God views success. Let's turn to the example of Richard Nixon, a historical figure who had a limitless potential to be remembered as a great leader of men. He won re-election with 49 out of 50 states. He'd be remembered as one of the greatest presidents in American history. But he was blinded by his own ambition. He wasn't satisfied with what he already had. He craved more. The type of man who pursued power for power's sake. There was no reason for Nixon to have the Watergate Hotel bugged. He would have won in a landslide anyway. But he didn't have the security of the promise that God gives us in Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why are we insecure? Why do we doubt ourselves or have low confidence when God tells us we can do all things through Christ? George Santayana, a Spanish-American philosopher, once told us that those who do not understand the past are condemned to repeat it. So we should learn from the mistakes of people like Nixon who lost everything in pursuit of victory. On the topic of victory, some of you may know, many of you may not, I took up a part-time job umpiring last summer. 
During that experience, I got to see kids and parents from all walks of life, from all over the state. I did go out of the state one time, went to Myrtle Beach <coughs> to call the All-American Games for Top Gun. And I noticed the people down there are much more quick-tempered. <laughs> uh, so I guess the further south you go, the less people are willing to tolerate. Uh, it must be the heat. Um, actually, I can attest to that. Um, <laughs> it was a long three-day weekend, and I had to call the championship game. And I was supposed to be on the bases, and this was like my fifth game of the day. I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. And I thought I had an easy game on the bases, but neither one of my partners had their plate gear, so I had to call the plate. And uh, I don't mem remember being that upset in a long time, and the heat certainly didn't help. <coughs> but anyway, back on the topic of victory. I would watch the teams before the games, and I noticed that some of the teams would take the time to pray, and some didn't. And uh, usually, in my experience, the teams that prayed seemed to be a little closer to each other. And I remember as a player myself, I always felt a special connection to my teammates when we bowed our heads to pray. There was just such a sense of community and belonging that comes from a shared identity in Christ. But a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, I noticed the coaches from the teams that didn't pray before the games, they were much more uptight. They wanted to win the games more than the kids did. <clears throat> I would watch them yell at these kids for simple mistakes, and they would grab them by the arm and sling them down on the bench and uh, point fingers in their face, maybe let a few cuss words fly. Of course, I didn't hear it. If you hear it, you're supposed to reject them, but I can read lips. Now, once you reach a certain age, um, there's almost nothing more motivating than a coach that you respect and want to make proud cussing at you. But these are kids between the ages of 10 and 12. I even called some 8U games. <clears throat> the kids were so scared of the coaches, they didn't even want to play the game anymore. And I've seen some coaches who were really bad about this type of thing. They would call the kids out in front of everybody. And it struck me if you'll permit me to translate this to the real world. <clears throat> the coaches were so focused on victory and success and winning that they forgot the entire reason they were out on the field in the first place, to help develop the athletic talents and characters of young people while they played the sport they loved. And there have been times in my life where I've been so focused on achieving a goal and I've been so driven to do something, whether it was getting good at an instrument or a sport or getting an A in a class, getting into a program, <clears throat> that I actually would lose myself in the process. And what I mean by that is I would forget that whether or not my goal is achieved, God will still love me and prepare a place for me all the same. So I had lost sight of the fact that I'm not defined by the things that I do or achieve, but I'm defined by the Father who gives me the opportunity to pursue my goals in the first place. When you look at it like that, the symptoms that we develop from pursuing the world, stress, anxiety, Depression, three categories that are statistically through the roof for my generation. They all take a back seat. Because let me ask you, how many times have you thought that you were in a situation that you would never get out of? You would never achieve your goal. And God worked it out. May not have been the way you wanted him to, but each and every one of us is sitting in this room today. So what can we learn from these men, men like Nixon, the coaches I described, and myself? When we lose sight of the giver 
and taker of all things in the world when we fail to acknowledge that we can do nothing without God, when we become more concerned with the world than we are about nurturing our relationship with Christ, then we're doomed to fail. Because here's a simple truth, and this is a bit of a side note, well, not really. Nothing can get you into heaven except for your personal relationship with Christ. The church can't save you on judgment day, which will come for us all. We can't avoid it. The gift of salvation has already been offered, but we have to accept it. And beyond just accepting it, we have to maintain a relationship with Christ. So I ask you, do you know Christ? Are you prepared to die and face Him at this very moment? Stranger things have happened. My heart's beating a little fast. I'm getting excited. Could have a heart attack. Or have you focused too much on the world and not enough on Him? Now we're getting into the serious, uncomfortable stuff. But we shouldn't sugarcoat this. This is the fate of our souls. And beyond that, if we don't have that personal relationship with Christ, how can we rest assured in the security of His promises? So what does success look like in this broken world of ours, you ask? So polite of you to ask. Success is being able to stand firm in your faith and commitment to Christ when everybody around you is abandoning Him. Success is being able to withstand the betrayal and greed of others with a smile on your face. Success is being able to rest assured in the security of God's promises, even when people doubt you, or even when you doubt yourself. Success is being able to wait for God to deliver on those promises without getting frustrated or upset. It's maintaining your integrity and your dignity when those around you choose to lie and sacrifice their morals. Success is loving your enemy, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 5.43. It is never making yourself out to be better than someone else. Success is being able to set goals for yourself and not lose sight of God in their pursuit. It is achieving a free mind where negative thoughts aren't allowed to rest. Success is being able to take the lessons of failure that God provides and keep moving forward. Being able to not latch too closely to your possessions by understanding that they are a gift. And just as they were given, they can be taken away. Success is identity in Christ. These things that I've just described, they're not possessions. They're not achievements. They are values. Values are what make a person truly successful. For they are what determines the quality of the person you have become. There are 100 different ways to pursue a goal, but your values will define the path you take. A man of value is a man of success. Back to Einstein. Try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. And he went on. He is considered successful in our day who gets more out of life than he puts in. But a man of value will give more than he receives. I leave you with a verse, Mark 8, 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now at this time, I think Graham's going to come to the front. We're going to have our hymn of response. Okay, he's coming up here. Thank you. Amen, right? We had planned for him to introduce the song, and then I was going to stand at the front. But I, I, want, I want to make sure that we've heard the invitation that's been given through this message this morning. Uh, that we will, and we could at any moment, stand before a holy God 
and be asked who our faith has been put in. And if you don't know that this morning, if you don't know the, the answer to that question, don't leave this place. There is peace in what God offers us. And it's, it's, so, it's, so, uh, it's a joy to see the giftedness of, of God in you, Zach, and how it's growing. But not only in you, but in every single one of you. And I hope that, that all of our youth know the immense value um, that you are in the kingdom of God. And not only for our youth, but our children. We've got a few still in here, but our children who are up there learning about God right now. And every single person in this place. We have immense value in the eyes of God and in, the, in, in this incredible desire that God has to dwell in us. And so I don't know where that leaves you this morning, but we're going to have a, a time of invitation um, singing a, a, a song that's a classic, Have Thine Own Way. And um, there, there's so much peace in allowing God to have his way in us, to dwell in us. Um, and there's so, many, there's so many roadblocks, and often it's our success. It's our definition of what we have succeeded in and what we have built for ourselves, and we don't want to let God in through that. So let me tell you this morning, during this song, if the Lord has spoken to you, respond to it, uh, and I'll be at the front to receive you um, in any way that you may come. So let us stand and sing, Have Thine Own Way. And this is one of those songs that can be played multiple times, so don't feel like you won't have enough time. You come on forward if the Lord's spoken to you. What a beautiful day of worship. Amen? Amen. And it's not over yet. We've got a lot of celebrating to do uh, as we uh, fellowship and eat some good food and uh, raise some money for our youth by um, bidding on and hopefully m- most of y'all winning some wonderful pies and cakes. And so uh, please do take the time while we're over there to, to go to our youth and, and tell them you appreciate them leading today. And um, uh, I, I look forward to that time with you, and if you're not able to stay, I hope that you have a, a good day in, in the things that you do. So, Lord, we thank you so much for your love and grace that's being poured out upon us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the value that you see in, our, in, in us. Lord, sometimes we don't see that in our, in our own selves, so I pray for every person here. Lord, that when we spend time praying to you and seeking you, that you would fill us 
And remind us of, of the image that you see in us. You don't see us as sinners that have messed up and, and, and thrown lives away. or anything. You see us as your children that you dearly love. Children of potential. Children of great worth and great value. And if we can see ourselves like that, Lord, there's nothing that we can't do. Um, and, and you'll lead us into the successes. And Lord, when, when things are a failure and we mess up a little bit, you'll help us grow and become even better through that. So we give you thanks for, for all good things. We give you thanks for these youth who've led us this morning. Uh, we thank you for, for them and uh, for the next generation of our church and the growth that you're giving them. And we just pray that they know uh, of, of the great value that they have to the kingdom of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.